Jim Nations is here today, and Jim is actually going to be doing a PowerPoint presentation today of um, something that's used. Jim Nations is here today, and Jim is actually going to be doing a PowerPoint presentation today of um, something that's usually always controversial, but we're just going to give you the facts. Uh, and Jim, I'm going to let you introduce it and start on it right away. We want to get as much in today as we possibly can. As a former Freemason, uh, I joined the Lodge in 1967. I was a young man. Uh, had gotten out of church, moved from North Louisiana down here with a new job, making plenty of money, and got out of church. And, uh, and my dad and my grandfather and great-grandfather had been Freemasons as far back as I could, you know, get, trace. And so it was something that, that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in that state I, I, uh, of mind and, and changing positions, I ran into a relative down here, and we were working together, and he be began to kind of probe me about it. And uh, so I was in the, wanting to put it off. This is something that, that Freemasons, you know, you, the, the people that are not don't know, that if you, if you lose a, a member of your body, a hand, a foot, or a leg, or anything, you cannot be a Freemason. You have to be fully attack that's part of it. so it's I not, didn't realize that it, it has to be that that's that's a part of it so it's not open to anyone uh, so he said if you was to happen to lose this you know down in, in work, the work we was doing with some of it was very dangerous he said then you wouldn't be qualified so I joined the lodge and uh, and took my entered apprentice degree uh, in December of 1967 and, uh, and we'll be sh dealing with this as we go through showing you some of the things and I'll be sharing some of my testimony uh, of what I learned. And, and, but about, about six months after I was raised to Master Mason, which was uh, the middle of, uh, of February of 68, uh, God began to stir me. And, you know, and I, I wonder you know, how this works. We don't understand every time what God does and how he operates, but we know that he does what's right. And so uh, it was in August of 68, he began to stir me and got me into a church with a very good pastor. And so as soon as I got into church, well, the Holy Spirit dealt with me about being in Freemasonry. And because as we go through this, you will find that you're under a death oath. And they tell you in the lodge, uh, don't, don't, let, don't listen to what people says on the outside. They don't like us. We've got more knowledge. We've got the light of, you know, the illumination of this mystery religion. And uh, so we'll tell you what we want you to know. And, and people that will say that, well, it's just a boys club and the oath don't mean anything, they're lying. It does mean something. And we'll prove that point before it's over with. But again, in dealing with this, as, as he dealt with me, and, and I wouldn't go to the lodge, I wouldn't uh, get involved in anything, but I would pay my dues, which at that time was very little, $10 a year. But he would deal with me from time to time, and it wasn't a constant thing, and all I could do was remind him of all the good things that they do. You know, they do a lot of good things, a lot of good works. And uh, we know about all of that, but, but the thing about it is, is they're depending, as most all or all religions are, is they're working their way and getting God in debt to them or obligated to them, whatever, and they're going to be saved by their good works, and we know that the Bible does not teach that. But there's a verse of Scripture that I want to kind of launch this with. It's in, the, it's in Revelation 17:5, And this is what we're going to be dealing with. And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the Great, the Mother of Harlots, and the Abomination of the Earth. So the mystery religions are all religions other than Christianity. Christianity is not a religion. The only mysteries that's been there, God has brought them out. He, and so the mystery religions, whether it's Catholicism, whether it's Mormonism, whether it's Freemasonry, whether it's any of the, the other religions, it's this, this verse of Scripture covers every one of them because it's, it's mystery. The word mystery wasn't put there just to fill up some space. When you go into any of their writings, you will find that the word mystery is used over and over and over again. I mean, it's just 
uh, in the catechism, Roman Catholic catechism, the word mystery is on every page. Sometimes it's on there several pages. And dealing with Freemasonry, the word mystery is there because it's, he, he put that there for a reason. So this is what, this verse of scripture covers all of them. So as we, as we move into this, we're going to, we're going to start out. This is another, um, fallacy of, of Freemasonry. It says, uh, in the first slide, as you can see, is F and AM, which stands for Free and Accepted Mason. But it didn't start that way. Uh, they were stone masons, and you've heard the term uh, etched in stone. Well, um, they left to tie all the, the popular people down through time as, and say they were masons. Uh, but unless they were stone cutters, stone hewers, and etchers are and recording history, they were not masons. Only the only masons up until, and we'll have the date in a few minutes, 17 or in the 17, early 1700s, they changed and it become free and accepted masons. It meant you didn't have to be a part of the craft, uh, which also connects to witchcraft, by the way. But uh, this is why that because of this being etched in stone, some of them had to be very educated and some of them had to rub shoulders with people in powerful positions of kings because they actually, they, they, and as we move on, let's move on uh, to, to this one. Uh, as we get to it, it'll change. Hopefully it'll change in a minute. Um, there it is. Okay. Um, but in dealing with this and in, in the stone masonry they they built the cities they built the walls they built the beautiful cathedrals uh, but uh, they also probably as far as we're concerned the most important thing that they did was they recorded history because in the old times the wars and the different tragedies and and the, the burnings of stuff if god would have allowed paper to be invented then that would have, we would have lost it all, but because he knew that it wouldn't, there's a lot of history that we need to that we need to know about, and so they etched it in stone, and it withstood all the the tragedies of history, and so as we go to, as we move to this this uh, actually the third slide, I want you to look at at the this is basically the pyramid of Freemasonry, starting with the Blue Lodge down at the bottom, and then as you go through the first, second, third degree of Freemasonry, then you can go. After that, you can go two rights. You can go uh, the York right, which is not as many degrees, and, and we're not going to get into every detail of this because it's going to take so long, or the Scottish right, which is the one on the, uh, the left-hand side, is the most popular. It goes to the 32nd degree, and then down under the arch, Roman arch, you've got uh, the different ones, and you've got uh, tied into that. You've got the Eastern star and the, and the different things that's involved in that, and we'll be doing dealing with that a little bit more. Uh, as we go through this, but the, up up in the upper uh, right hand corner, there is the the G with the all seeing eye in it. That is a Masonic symbol. The all seeing eye is an Illuminati symbol, which that's a you know. Then you go into well, we're dealing with uh, the mysteries and the you know the uh, all the different things. But it is and the G, the the G is also a part of Freemasonry. It stands for geometry which they used in the, the etching of the stones and building the temples and different things. But there's also in the Fellowcraft degree, it says that word, that letter can stand for God. So as we get a little further, you'll understand why I made that very clear, that, uh, that the word God is there, the, word, the letter G is there and has a reason for being there. And then we'll move on uh, a little bit further going into this. But this is just the pyramid that we're showing of, of Freemasonry and the different rites and the different uh, steps as you go up, ascending up to be uh, illuminized. Uh, again, the, the word illumina. And, and as we get a little further, we'll see that when you join the lodge and you go into the lodge room, you're in search of light. And we'll cover, and we're going to use a lot of verses of scripture uh, to prove that Jesus knew this and he knew what they were going to say and what they were going to claim. And he wrote some scriptures that means different things to me, and it doesn't take it, it doesn't do violence to the scripture, it just means because of where I've been, it means it means something to me very special. Now we're dealing with this particular uh, PowerPoint slide from the fig leaves in the garden, which Freemasonry connects their Masonic aprons to Tubal Cain, to Nimrod, and the builders of the Tower of Babel, the first rebellion against God after the flood, like Hiram of Tyre, who some believe seduced Solomon, uh, none of them 
And, of course, we know that Solomon was to start with. None of them were followers of the God of the Bible. So they connect to Tubal Cain, uh, is one of their words in the words in the inner apprentice degree, uh, who was the first polygamist. He married two wives. He had the sons that, that were the fathers of the sheep herders, the musicians, and the metal workers. And they claim he was the first master craftsman in metal. And, uh, and let me say, we're not going to take phone calls today. So if you, if you get a question, just get your pen and piece of paper and or write it down. Or email us right now on air at jsm.org. Mm -hmm. And I'll okay. make sure Jim gets to answer the question. Okay. So in, in dealing with this, we're, we're looking at people now that have joined a mystery religion that uh, claims to be, you know, and they, they, some will deny that it's a religion, but we, we can prove that it is without any shadow of a doubt. We can prove that it is a religion. That's right. And uh, because anytime you have a lodge room with an altar, with a holy book, whether it's the Bible or the Quran or whatever, and you kneel there, then it's a religion, and they can do whatever and say whatever they want to. But it's Swagger, they use the phrase, we are not a religion, but we are religious. We're not a secret organization, but we do have secrets. So they'd like to tuck in these riddles. Mm -hmm. They'd like to yes, give that do. impression. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, they're not, and, and one of the things they, they say very clearly, they are not creed bound. Well, to a Christian, we are creed bound. Right. We are bound by what the scripture says. Sola Scriptura. We are bound by, by what the true that's doctrines right, of the Bible right. are. But to a Freemason, they are not creed bound. And that's one of the things that, that, right. that is troubling as a Christian and as a pastor to see pastors who come in and admit that they're in darkness when they're not in darkness if they have Jesus Christ. And we will be, we'll be covering that. And, and we just dealt with the, the connection to the, to the apron and the Garden of Eden. And, and, and on this particular slide, we have an apron on the left-hand side. Uh, and again, I just put it there because I want to make some connections. Uh, again, when we get into this and begin to explain it, we're not only dealing with the mystery religions, but we're dealing with the fertility cult. You cannot deal with any religion, whether it's Catholicism, Mormonism, Freemasonry, whatever, without getting involved in the fertility cults. So we have the all-seeing eye at the top, and on the, uh, the left-hand side we have the sun, which is a, the worship of the sun, and we will find out and prove that that's what Freemasonry is. It's sun worship. It's Baal worship. Then on the left hand, uh, on the right hand side, away from the sun, we have the moon, the crescent moon, which is the female deity. And it's interesting that that uh, on the way to work this morning, I always listened to, to Jill and Gabe reading the Bible. Uh -huh. And they were reading from uh, Jeremiah, the 44th chapter. And I was sitting there listening to that, and I said, wow, isn't this interesting that, that as they describe worshiping the Queen of Heaven, praying to her, doing all the things that they do to her. And in Brother Swagger's notes, he was talking about the male-female deity. And, and uh, so we find this in dealing with that. This, the crescent moon is, represents the female uterus. And the sun worship is the male image, and they, they mate. Right. And they produce, you know, the witchcraft calls Mother Earth. We're going to find Freemasonry. It refers, refers to, mother, to, to Earth as Mother Earth. We're going to see a slide, a slide as we go through this. So when you start looking at all the connections, let's look at the, the floor of the lodge. is black and white tiles. Uh, it's a balance of, of light and darkness. It's a balance of good and evil. They didn't, the, the light that they give you that you're looking for when you join is not going to do away with all the darkness. It's going to balance it between, you know, so then that's not Christian. That's not gospel. Let's look at on the right hand side of this slide is, uh, is the, the Grand Lodge of free, mace, free and Accepted Masoners of Alabama. I want to make another connection. In the center we have, again, the arch of, of the Roman arch. We have the Masonic symbol, but look on the look on the, the left side of this of this column, we've got a pair of keys. And of course if you know that all popes have a coat of armor, and in that coat of armor is the keys that uh, they claim that Jesus gave to Peter. And they're always there. Well, then we've got Freemasonry. They have the keys again. They, they, they have a real key up there? No, the no, Pope okay. does. Yeah, the, the, the Pope does. It's the same symbol. Yeah. Same I got symbol you. Sense. Okay. But the Pope has a set of keys okay. that he inherited from two pagan gods 
uh, Janice and Sybil. Right. And he claims that they, these are the keys that Jesus gave to Peter, and so they inherited them. And as a matter of fact, that's a long, interesting story about how that. <laughs> but happened, anyway, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, how that happened. But uh, so I just wanted to make some more connections here with the with the two columns. We're going to be dealing with the two pillows uh, a little bit more as we move on. Um, let's go into this one. Uh, again, uh, Masons built the walls and fortresses, the temples, the Tower of Babel, and the pyramids. But the most important thing, they wrote history in stone. We've already touched on that. They helped build Solomon's temple. Solomon made a covenant with Hiram of Tyre. You can read this in 1 Kings, the fifth chapter, as he deals with this. And when you really, when you look at it, and I know you don't, because I, I all of this, I've, I've, I've researched it. Hiram of Tyre began to court David. And as soon as David died, he started courting uh, Solomon. And so it was forbidden by God to make a covenant with the heathen, for which Solomon may have lost his soul. We don't know. We're not saying he did, but I can tell you right now, he got off into some heavy stuff with pagan wives building altars and offering sacrifices to pagan gods and so this is, a, this is something that, that you guys that claim to be Christians, that knows Christ as your personal Savior, need to realize that this was the downfall of Solomon as he got involved in pagan right. Baal worship. So uh, as, we, as we look into this and you read that chapter and see, how that, uh, see what happened in this uh, with Solomon. And, and, but again, the seduction of paganism is powerful. It's powerful. At this time, Tyre, and we just talked about the king of Tyre, was the, the seat of Baal worship. And we, we have Jezebel, who was the daughter of a later king of Tyre. Um, and and we'll, we will deal with that a little bit more. Married King Ahab, who was the king of the northern tribes, the 10 tribes of Israel. And uh, as, we, as you know, if you read about Jezebel in the Bible, um, Baal worship became the primary religion in Israel. And then as we move on again, this uh, time seems to fly so fast when we do this. Uh, again, when you get into to dealing with Elijah, steps out on the pages of the Bible and cries, how long halt ye between two opinions? Again, you remember the story uh, where he did this because Baal worship had become so prominent and and Jezebel was destroying the prophets of, of God, and, and she had the, the 450 prophets of Baal. And, and, a, and Elijah, the Tishbite, just steps out out of seemingly almost nowhere and asks the question, how long halt you between two opinions? And, and we, we would like to do that today. If you're, if you're a Freemason and you claim that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then I would ask you that question. You need to know who you're going to serve. You can't, we, and we, we're going to do this later. You can't serve two masters. It's not possible. Jesus says it's not possible. If Jehovah be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. The God that answers by fire, let him be God. And we know that they were fire worshipers. They were sun worshipers. And so as we move on again, uh, their search for light, dealing with man from the garden on down. Their search for light and a secret word. And this is what they always tell you. They'll give you a word in the, in the first degree, the inner apprentice degree. They'll give you another word in the fellow craft degree. They'll actually give you two words in the master mason's degree and they will tell you that you're looking for the, the, the name of God. And so we're going to tell you who that is. Uh, their search for light and a secret word, the true name of God that you never get and we're going to you know, just deal with that. It is always another degree, more secrets, pagan rituals, and more money, and more control. That's what it always is. And we'll, we'll be showing some sound bites, too, as we go through this. When the name that is above all names is given in the Bible for everyone to see, believe and follow. Jesus' name the name of Jesus is not used in the rituals of the Blue Lodge. It's not allowed in any of the rituals of the Blue Lodge. To, his name is not mentioned whatsoever. You have to believe in a God in order to be a Mason. And it's not specified which God it is. And we're going to have a man in a few minutes as we see the sound bites who uh, was, a, was a Satanist. 
but he got in the lodge and he never heard anybody had anybody to witness to him about salvation uh, in the lodge. So again, uh, the, Jesus' name is not used in the rituals of the Blue Lodge. They are in some of the higher degrees. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, talking about Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ Amen. is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the only way to God is through Jesus Christ, and the only way to Jesus is through the cross of Calvary. So again, your, your Philippians 2, the second chapter, the 9 through 11, you join something that promises you light, and you don't get it. And Jesus talked about that, and we're going to deal with it as we move on. So let's look at this one. And again, uh, we, let me just deal with this a little bit. It's not Mahabon. If you want to get a shot of this, this is written by uh, a former worshipful master, uh, Ronan, who was, uh, I think it's 629, we'll have it up in a minute, uh, who got saved and got out of it and began to expose it. Um, the word that they use in the Master Mason's degree. And let me say this, whenever God dealt with me um, and, and just kept dealing with it, he was so merciful. And I, I just, you know, I just, it, it's a very touchy. And I, I, I wondered why, you know, why I wouldn't just do what he said and get out. But there was a reason. He always has a reason. He's very merciful. And, and, and in his foreknowledge, he knew that when I did get out. That, okay. That I you know, expose. but here to the observer out there that really doesn't know that much about it, um, you know, I need to know the steps that you're taking, Jim, to get to where you are. Because it looks to me like a Christian, and you can answer this question, when they first go in there and, and they start swearing these oaths or searching for Jesus or, or the name of God, you find that in the pages of the Bible. Yeah. So why would they search elsewhere? There's, there's several reasons. Curiosity uh, is very powerful. Uh, as you know, is, is if you do any research, you find that a lot of the presidents of the United States, people in high positions, people of authority, uh, judges, lawyers, politicians, um, there's, they can get promotions on the job. They, I've, I've this. Is this names of God up here? This, this Maha Bones? Not Maha Bones. Not, what do they mean? I, it's, I've, it's I've never just, heard them before. It's just a secret word that's the Master Mason's degree. And, and let me just give you a little, let me just, you know, because they, they like to say, well, this is just a good old boys club and, and it's not that important. Mike told a testimony about a man that was here during yeah, the camp meeting. I was going to bring that up. Sister Swangard, I was, this was at the last camp meeting. And I sat down with this precious gentleman that used to be a 33rd degree uh, Freemason and uh, has told me he's no longer a Freemason, that, he, uh, that God brought him out of that. And so he, we were asking, you know, I'm asking questions, I'm answering questions. He's realized, you know, he said to me, he says, there's no way that you were not a Freemason. You know too much. And he said to me, he says, would you speak the unspeakable word? And I said, are you talking with the one that is supposed to be done at the five points of fellowship and whispered and never spoken out loud? And his face just dropped. He said, you know that word? I said, yes, I know that word. I said, Mahabon. I said, you won't say it? And fear gripped him. He said, no, I will not say it. I said, let me ask you a question. If God has set you free from the binds of Freemasonry, why won't you say it? Because I've made a solemn oath. I made a solemn vow. I said, I had made many solemn oaths and vows when I was in a cult. When God set me free, he set me free from those oaths. I'm not bound by those. I said, when I was in the Catholic Church, I made solemn vows and oaths. But I am free from those as God delivered me from that. But he still would not speak it. And, and it's and it something that uh, he's still bound by some of the fears that. that word that's supposed to be more Well, there's there. a lot of secrecy within <laughs> Freemasonry that they just, it's, it's and, and that's one of the pulls of it. That that's you're part right. of a society or you're part of a group of people in which you know things nobody right. else does. So right. there's a pride that's attached to it. And especially if it's tied to Christianity. Now, uh, Albert Mackey said this. He said, there, the, 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 the name of Jesus is removed slightly, but necessarily is the name of Jesus removed from Freemasonry. 
In other words, it is used, but not in the major, like as, as, as Brother Jim said, in the oaths and in the, in the, the major aspects of uh, Freemasonry, it's not used in the respect it should be. It's not used in the Blue Lodge at all. Not, it's not in the Blue Lodge ritual at all. It's in some of the higher degrees. But let me tell you how powerful this is, and I don't understand why I accept it's demonic. There's no mm -hmm. doubt in my mind it's demonic. Um, when God dealt with me for so long and got, really got to dealing with me very and there were some things that led up to it which I don't have time to go into, but I walked into, and this was, must have been 1980 or 81, I walked into the, one of, I guess probably the oldest Christian book store here in Baton Rouge on Florida Boulevard. Knew the man personally. He was a personal friend of mine and I was very, ups I was very agitated because I was, you know, I had been forbidden by death oath to look on the outside, but I walked in and was beginning to struck up a conversation with him and, and, and he could tell that, that something was wrong. And so he began to question, what are you looking for? What can I help you with? And so I stumbled around for a little while and God put us in, ex in, ex in the most perfect spot. I mean, I can look back and see that he had us move to an area of that bookstore where there was a bookcase sitting there. And so I finally said, I'm looking for a word that I have been told it's not written down anywhere in the world. And he said, and I wouldn't say it for the same reason you just said. I wouldn't say it. I said, it is the secret word of a master mason. And so he just turned to the side, right beside that bookshelf, which was, which was uh, listed as cults and occults, reached in there and pulled a little small, and I was gonna bring it with me, but I went on for a little small paperback book about three by five, and he just flipped the pages and turned it around and laid it right in front of me. And there the word was Mahabon and my whole world just collapsed because I realized that I had been lied to and deceived. And of course I bought the little book and I still have it in my possession and it exposes the era of Freemasonry. Or that was the beginning of my study of Freemason. So it's not Mahabon, it's not Jabelon, which we know J-A-H uh, is Jehovah, Baal is Baal, B-A-A-L, and then On was one of the religions of Egypt. We remember that Joseph's father-in-law was a priest of, of this religion of On down in, and so these three words are combined in the higher degrees of Freemasonry, and three different men has to join themselves together, and this word cannot be spoken anywhere but in the lodge with three men joined together in a circle, dancing around, and one says jaw, one says bell, and one says on. So we're dealing with staunch paganism is what we're dealing with. And let me tell you this as we're here with this, with jaw, bell, on, again, in Jeremiah, uh, and we're going to go to Ezekiel later on in this presentation, uh, they would go to the temple, the Israelite people would go to the temple and say, we're free to worship Baal and Jehovah. What are these Freemasons doing? They're doing exactly the same thing. They're worshiping Jehovah, Baal, and the God of On. So it's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's not any of this. So if you claim to be a Christian and, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, then you've got the name that is above every name, and you don't need any of these others, and you need to renounce it. As I wept before God whenever he showed me what I was involved in and he let me know that it was satanic. Now you can tear your clothes and throw dirt in the air if you want to, but I can prove that it's satanic, it's demonic. I literally fell on the floor and began to weep and beg him to forgive me for getting involved in this. And, and as, as I was there weeping before him, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, you renounce it and in and, and the name of Jesus and, and, and just you know get away with it, get away from it. Uh, so that's what I did. I renounced it in the name of Jesus Christ and, 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 and God began to open doors for me from that day on because I did what he said to do and began to open things up. Acts 4, 2, I'm just going to give you some scriptures. Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He is the light and he is the life and the life. Why would you look anywhere else? Why would you? If, I mean, if you're a Christian, you've got the light and the life who is Jesus Christ. Uh, again, the secrets of Freemasonry, what does the Bible say? 
uh, Isaiah 45, 19, God spoke and said, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. So God's not, he, he's, he's, God is about bringing things to light. Men left to cover things up. God will bring right. it to light. Um, there's a lot of other verses of Scripture. I'm just going to touch some again in, in John, St. John's Gospel, the 18th chapter and the 20th verse. Jesus answered him. Now, Jesus is at before the Sanhedrin and he's on trial and he's going to be crucified. And he's the religious leaders. Jesus answered him. And I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temples where the Jews always resort. And I have said nothing in secret. So you guys that believe that Jesus and his disciples had their secret meetings and are part of Freemasonry, that's not what the Bible says. And if you believe that above what Jesus said, then I got a problem with you being a Christian. So you need to hear what he's saying. And like I said, this means something to me that it may not mean to anybody else. And I know that most people that are watching this, if they don't know anything about Freemasonry, then a lot of it may not make sense to them. But I can tell you, Jesus had a reason for saying everything he said. And he said, I have said nothing in secret. And he's saying that to you guys that are doing your secret thing in your secret rooms. All right, Matthew 13, 33, an interesting verse. Matthew 13, 33, and it's interesting that 13, 33 is two powerful numbers in the occult world. Jesus spoke another parable, and this is the 13th chapter is about the parables of the kingdom of heaven. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until the whole was leavened. The question, the lodge is the widow. I was a widow's son, referred to as a widow's son, as a Freemason. Is this the woman? I'm asking the question. Some Freemasons say that Jesus was one of them, and we've already talked about that. We know that he said, I didn't do anything in secret. I didn't speak anything in secret. But we, as we go into this, we're going to see the leaven has come into the church. And uh, it's, we've, the lump is just about leavened. It's just about completely leavened because this is what's happening. We're living in that time at the end of this church age. As Brother Swaggart done an excellent job yesterday morning preaching about the end of this age. Uh, and men will not endure sound doctrine. They, they, they have, we have come to that place to where they will not endure sound doctrine. Again, Luke 11:33. Listen to what Jesus said. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is single, the whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is evil, the body is full of darkness. And then he said, 11.35, take heed, therefore, that the light which is in you is not darkness. And I'm telling you, when you join the lodge and you walk through those doors and you're hoodwinked, you're blindfolded, and they, they, if, you get, if, you, if this spirit grips you, when you remove that blindfold, you're still hoodwinked, spiritually speaking. And I'm telling you, Jesus knew what he was talking about. And of course, this means things to me that it doesn't mean to you because I've been there. I've been hoodwinked and I've been blinded by this so-called light that I found out was not light at all. It was darkness and it is darkness. Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Again, we're taking death oaths that we will be, allow our throat to be cut from ear to ear, our heart torn out, our bowels go, uh, cut open. Uh, these death oaths, he says, whenever they do this to you, and, and it, it, listen, there's nothing, there's no way that it cannot affect you. It's not any way that it can't affect you, because I can prove it, because I was one, I know. So, but he says, don't fear them. This man that was fearful to say right, the word, right. even after he'd come out. I mean, that, that blows my mind, that a man would, would be fearful of saying that word that he claims that God has, has delivered him. That's scary to me. So don't, don't fear these, these people that says they can kill your body. You defear, you have, he should be fearing God that says, I can destroy both body and soul in hell. Moving on, Luke 12, 3. Therefore, whatsoever, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness, listen to this, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and I know you say that's going to be out in the future. Listen, that's right now. 
you're doing this in the darkness, you're doing this in the room, you're doing this in behind closed doors, you've got the, the, the lodge sealed with the tile, no cowans or eavesdroppers, and you're in, you're in darkness. He said, therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear Listen, the secret word of a master mason is to be said at low breath on the five points of fellowship in the ear. That's why nobody would say it out loud because we've been commanded not to. So this is what you, don't tell me that Jesus didn't know what you guys were going to do. He's God. He knew exactly what you were going to do in your secret rooms, in your secret orders. What's spoken in the ear, whispered in the ear, he said, in closets. Uh, and and it, could be, it could have been an inner chamber shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Jesus is saying, what I'm telling you, talking to his disciples, what I'm telling you, and when we were having our meetings, you can shout it from the housetop. You don't have to be under the fear of saying something that's, that's, uh, that's wrong. Uh, Ephesians 5, 11, and 12, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Listen, and we don't have time to get into everything that's going on in these chambers, but there's some, there's some very shameful things that goes on. And the very fact that, that they would threaten you with a death oath is shameful enough. Ephesians 5.13, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. In other words, it brings it out. It don't cover it up. It don't conceal it. It brings it out. It manifests it. And this is what we're talking about. Again, we're going to move on now into when, when free and accepted masonry come into existence. Again, we said this earlier that there was a time for several, a couple of thousand years, maybe even longer, uh, very much longer, really, because it starts, goes back to the garden. But, but where... You could not be a mason unless you was a stone mason. You had to be a part of the stone cutters, the hewers, and the placers, and the etchers in stone. But in the year of 1722, and some will vary different dates, but it won't vary very much, uh, the masons became known as free and accepted masons. You will see this on their, on their advertisements at the lodge. It will be F and A-M, free and accepted masons. You no longer had to be of the craft, which was a stone mason but you can still be a witch of the witchcraft and be a, and be a freemason this opened the door for many powerful and corrupt men to come into the craft and the new world order had another player which i believe was started by the roman catholic church and the jesuits to work for the vatican in the protestant community and we have more proof that, that we can that we can use to back that up we're going to show the first uh, clip. If you want to get a shot of this book, this is Masonry Beyond the Light. Uh, I use this. I bought this. Uh, I use it a lot. I recommend it to people that's interested in finding out about Freemasonry. The man that, that wrote it, his name is William Schneblin, uh, and we're going to find out some interesting things about him. But in this book is, is everything that you need. There's a whole chapter dealing with the Eastern Star. Uh, he does lots of videos. Uh, but this is an older one that he done quite a few years ago. It's actually on the internet. If you would like to go to the internet and, and, and type up uh, William Schneblin or Schneblin, uh exposing the Illuminati from within, it's over, it's over two hours long, but it's very interesting and very informative. So let's see the sound bite. I wanted to get into the ministry, which in my case was through the uh, Roman Catholic Church. That's what I was raised in and I knew very little about the Bible, and I wanted to be a priest. When I got to college, however, I had my plans somewhat derailed by two forces that were very strong at that time. This was the time of the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, when a lot of ferment was taking place in the Catholic Church. A lot of my professors were telling me that the Bible wasn't really true, what little I knew about the Bible was false, that Moses didn't really part the Red Sea, that uh, Adam and Eve never really existed, that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. What did that leave me, you know? Here I was gonna be a priest, and I didn't know what to believe in. The other thing that happened, two convergent forces, is I had some professors that today would have been called New Agers. Back then the word wasn't even heard of. 
And they played on a doctrine that's part of Catholic theology. And this doctrine is the idea that the priest is another Christ. And when you go up on the altar and you confect the sacrament of the Eucharist, as it's called, which means you turn the bread and wine literally into the body and blood of Jesus, you are acting literally as another Christ. And they told me, these, these particular professors, if I wanted to do that, if I wanted to be another Christ, I had to do the same things that Jesus did to attain that exalted state. See, they did not believe that Jesus was God Almighty. They believed he was a kind of ascended master and that he had learned how to do all of these things by going and studying under gurus in the Far East and studying under the Magi of Egypt. And some of you may have heard about this, either from bookstores or TV shows, The Lost Years of Jesus. Now here I was, I was 18, 19 years old. I was being told this stuff by people who had PhDs, THDs, DDs, you know, all that stuff behind their name, you know, Roman collars on. What was I supposed to think? So I believed them. I began studying the occult because I thought this was the way that I would become more Christ-like. All right, here's what I don't know, Jim. When they work, walk through that door to join, take them, do you have a section where you take them through the different steps we, that they have to become a Freemason? Yeah, we, we're going we're gonna to show them, we're going to show one coming through the door. Through, between okay, the that's what I want. And, and, and because we, we've been sharing all these wonderful verses of Scripture about why it's wrong, but what is it? Yeah, we need to yeah. show what's wrong. We're going to show them uh, the candidate kneeling at the altar to the worshipful master. Yeah. Okay, that's what, yeah. You know, like if I'm walking, and I'm going to ask you that question. Okay. We'll be right back. We're going to just take an excerpt from, the, from a book. This is written by a former worshipful master of Keystone Lodge, number 639 in Chicago, Illinois. It's also in this book, uh, The Master's Carpet by um, Ronan a man by the name of Ronan Edmund. Uh, it says, Masonry and Baal worship are identical. Now, this is a man that was a former worshipful master of a lodge there. And he got out and he began to expose it. Uh, are identical, reviewing the similarity between Masonry, Romanism, and the mysteries. There's the word again, use it, we use this, and comparing the whole with the Bible. And again, past master of Keystone Lodge, number 639 in Chicago. Uh, again, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what con concord hath Christ with Belial, or Baal, or Satan, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Let's go on now. This is going to get into to some of the things that's, that's in the lodge that you have to recognize the head of the lodge is referred to as the worshipful master. Now, that okay, let me ask this question, Jim. When you first, they take you, you go into the doors, and you're going in to, I guess you're going in to be a mason, or you wouldn't be yeah, there, right? Right, right. You don't, you don't get there unless you, unless you petition the lodge. And they've accepted you. And they, they have an initiation that they put the man through. It's called through the, each level. It's, yeah, okay. each level. This and is, the head of the lodge, as you just said, is the worshipful, worshipful master. master. Um, that name right there is enough to keep you from being involved sure. with it if you're a Christian. Okay, go but ahead. But you're I'm you're sorry. at a great disadvantage. You're you're the the preparation room. Then we're going to see a picture just after this one. There's one more after this one. We're going to see a candidate that's coming in and how he's dressed. You've, you're, you're blindfolded. They call it a hoodwink. Uh, you're at a very you're at a great disadvantage. And, and, of course, they know how to do this because a lot of it's based on psychology and paganism. Uh, again, to worship a master, uh, this, is what, this is what is said in the degree. As the sun rises in the east to rule over the day, so rises the worship of master in the east to rule over the lodge. And we're going to see this in a few minutes where he's standing. He rises, he walks down to the altar and is standing in front of the altar and the candidate is kneeling at the altar to the worshipful master and takes his death oath. So, and we're going to get a little bit further in this, but My this goodness. is uh, the worshipful master again says, Matthew 23, 10 says, neither call ye, neither be ye called master for one is your master, even Christ. And we keep saying that because Jesus said these things. Mm -hmm. it, it, it means different things to different right. people. But he, all right, here we go. 
This is a man, he's, been, he's coming out of the preparation room in the entered apprentice degree. When you join the Masonic Lodge, you're in search of light. And we see, let's look at this now, because I want you to, to, to look at the, behind him, behind this candidate, uh, is two columns, uh, which is a part of, of the lodge. You come through the door between the two columns. We got a, a, some, some um, uh, slides in a few minutes of what these two columns represent. Uh, they actually represent the legs of a woman, by the way. So we're gonna get heavy into the fertility cuts and we're gonna have to be very careful. Around this, uh, this candidate's neck is called a cable toe, a rope. Uh, in witchcraft, it's called the umbilical cord, by the way. So again, we've got mm -hmm. connections. The left knee is exposed and the left breast is exposed. When you walk through, they will receive you on the point of a sharp object to your chest. And begin and begin your initiation, and it's, again, it is to bring it's to br bring some fear. They want to fear you. They want you to fear rather, as you as you go through this. So you will obey them. Uh, the worshipful master is to be obeyed without question. Uh, I could tell some stories about what happened to me after I. That's just plain there. scary. Why is his Why is his pants leg up halfway his leg? That's part of it, and and, and the fellow craft is it's it's the right leg, and then I think in the master mason's degree it's both. But it's just what they're doing. Okay, is that, now so what are they doing right there? They're just just showing you how the candidate enters the lodge, and then he comes through the door between the two columns, which is Jackin and Boaz, okay. and. Uh, but it's just, that's the, that's the way you, you appear. Okay, Mike. i got to add something. If you look at the very back, you see the Star of David, yeah, which is I'm a going. hexagram. Yeah. And this is a symbol that has been used in sorcery. Right. This is a symbol that's used in sorcery. Hexagram is a symbol used in sorcery. He comes in, he's blindfolded, he's got the, the tow rope. By the way, what you're looking at is very similar to the way they would look during the initiation of Satanism. But, in, but instead of using the sharp point of a compass, they would actually use their ceremonial, ceremonial dagger. Yeah, absolutely. So again, we see John, uh, St. John 1 and 4 in him talking about Jesus was light and the light was the light of men. So again, don't look anywhere else. You've got it. And John 1 and 5, and the light shined into the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. John 8, 12, then Jesus spoke again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So again, we're moving on as we de deal with this. Again, we're dealing with the manual of the lodge by Mackey. And this is what happens. And again, we've said this on another program when, when someone called in. And in this book, it refers to a reverend coming to join the lodge. And this is what is said in, in the degree uh, he stands outside without or outside our portals. Now we're talking about the lodge now. He stands outside of our portals. Well, we refer to portals as the portals of glory, the portals. Have, so he's and, and on the threshold of his new Masonic life in darkness, helplessness, and ignorance. So this is who Reverend, you know, if you're there and you're a Christian, you know the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what you've admitted. That you're, that you're in darkness and you're ignorant and helpless, having been wandering amid the errors and covered over with pollution of the outer and profane world, he comes inquiringly to our doors seeking the new birth. I thought it wasn't religious. I thought it's not a religion. They said it's not a religion. The new birth? And you're saying now, if you're a Christian, you're there for the new birth and you haven't been born again. You're denying some very uh, powerful things and renouncing some things and asking a withdrawal of the veil. Jesus is the only one that withdrew the veil. When he cried, it's finished. Amen. The veil ripped from top to bottom and the word was whosoever will may come. So we're looking at things that the average Mason don't know or don't remember, but you need to. You need to know but who you're But Jim, that's blasphemy. Absolutely. It's For gonna, somebody it, that's a born-again Christian, how did you feel <coughs> when you were kneeling at that altar and you were repeating those words? Well, again, at the time, I was out of church, and it, it had been I had been influenced. My dad, you know, was a mason. It went back in our family. I saw that it was very powerful, uh, and that, that's very appealing to the flesh. 
And I was I was young, and they they. Liked and you me. didn't know. But let me go back. If the TV would put that back up on the screen, I, because I want our listeners to look at that, seeking the new birth and asking a withdrawal of the veil, veil which conceals the divine truth from his uninitiated sight. Divine truth? No, not See, possible. That's Why would God? Conceal divine truth. The whole aspect is Jesus said, I Found am the way, the, the truth, and yeah. the life. Now, by accepting Jesus Christ, we open ourselves up to that divine revelation by the Holy Spirit. The Bible said the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you into all truth. It's not a junior warden, it's not the senior warden, it's not the worshipful master, it's not one of the deacons that leads and guides you into all truth. The Bible says the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. The idea that we need a Freemason to remove that veil is an abomination. Pastors, and I know there are some pastors watching right now, there are many pastors in, in, the, in the Baptist organization that are involved in Freemasonry. There are some that, is making, that have made a stand against it. And it's not the only religion that does that. I've met Pentecostal preachers that have been Freemasons. Yeah. Let me say this, or X have been involved but are no longer involved. Let me say this. The idea that you think that you were veiled from the truth and it took a Freemason to, uh, to allow that veil to be removed is an insult to God. I'm not going to say it's a blasphemy in the Holy Spirit, but it's de <coughs> de definitely a blasphemy to God. It's borderline. Mm -hmm. All right, here we have the next slide is the, the picture of the candidate. He's kneeling at the altar. Uh, and if you notice, again, the worshipful master has risen in the east, and he's walked down and right in front of the altar, and the candidate is actually kneeling to the worshipful master. He has his hand on the Bible on, in, in most cases, but there can be, and we're going to find out, we're going to find in, in their own writings that it does not have to be a Bible. It can be a Quran or it can be a, a, a Vedas or whatever. But anyway, the altar always faces east, and we're going to get into some more scriptures later on. If we get to them today, I don't know. At the altar kneeling to the worship of Master after the candidate has kissed the Bible, and William Shenevlin says in here, is, he kissed it goodbye, is what he did. Uh, he is asked by the worship of Master, in your present condition, what do you most desire? And of course, he's told by the senior warden, I believe it's the senior warden that's brought him there, uh, he says, light. I'm in search of light. And as you go up the degrees, every, every degree, the the uh, fellow craft degree is more light. Third degree, master mason degree is more light. So you're in search of light when, if you know Jesus Christ, you've got the only true light. Oh, yes, amen. All right, let's go on. All right, the hoodwink is removed from the candidate's eyes. The worship of master says, I will now thank you to remove the cable toe as we now hold the brother by a stronger tie. And I ask the question, who, what is it? What is this stronger tie? It's a death oath. And again, Matthew 6, 24 says, no man can serve two masters. That's it's just right. not possible. All right, next video clip. So we began to work in, in Satanism. And I learned that, that Anton LaVey, and this may astonish some of you, but Anton LaVey's brand of Satanism is like kid stuff. It's entry-level Satanism, so to speak, because it's used primarily to draw people into the darker stuff. And it's very evil, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's not like it's a Sunday school picnic or anything, but compared to the real serious Satanism, it's, it's totally, totally harmless, relatively speaking. In order to get into that, though, there was something very important I had to do. I had to become a Freemason, because you can't get involved in Satanism on the hardcore level without first being a Freemason. And so I found someone, I was sponsored into the Masons, and I became a first, second, third degree Mason. Uh, I went through the York Rite, I went through the shrine. In fact, this is my, uh, my little shrine portrait here. As you can see by this time, I would kind of shed some of my hippie appearance. But this is just kind of by way of documentation that I, I really was involved in these things. That was my official shrine portrait, which they took as part of my initiation. Uh, then soon after that, I, I went through the Scottish Rite as well, so I basically covered all the branches of masonry that there are to do. Uh, and then I went even beyond that. But uh, this is my certificate, 
what, as a, as a uh, sublime prince of the royal secret, that's the title, 32nd degree Mason. See, Masons love big sounding titles. I mean, they just think that's the greatest thing, you know. You, they have titles like Perfect Master, Most Perfect Master, Perfect Excellent Master. There's a couple things I just want you to notice about this, and I'll come back to it later. You'll notice the all-seeing eye up there, and you'll notice the motto, Ordo Ab Cal. Uh, so once I went through all of that, I was worthy. I was ready to become involved in hardcore Satanism. What did that mean? Well, that meant I had to sell my soul to the devil. That's interesting what he said, and again, this video is available on, on the internet. You can go and type in uh, William Schneblin and uh, exposing the Illuminati from within, and this gets a lot more serious as we go up, and again, it's over two hours long, uh, but it's very, very informative. Uh, again, let's, let's use the Bible to, to refute this, Ephesians 5, chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not you therefore partakers with them, for you were once in darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You don't need Freemasonry. In Christ you have everything you need. Let's go into this now. This is, this is a, a, a book that was written by a, a Freemason. He died, as far as I know, he died a Freemason. W.L. Wilmshurst, a lecture in the Lodge in the 1860s, said in his book, The Meaning of Masonry, the initiate is placed in the northeast corner. By the way, this is called the northeast corner lecture. I, I remember it well. He's placed in the northeast corner. He has two paths open to him, a path of light and a path of darkness. Again, remember, the tiles on the floor of the lodge are black and white. It's a balance. It's a balance of, it's not doing away total. And, and if you read in some of their, they'll tell you that darkness is necessary. It has two paths open to him, a path of light and a path of darkness, a path of good and a path of evil. The northeast corner is the symbolical dividing place between the two. Again, this is page 34, <laughs> The Meaning of Masonry, Listen to this. The north always signifies the place of imperfection and undevelopment. In olden times, the bodies of suicides, reprobates, and unbaptized children. Now, do Protestants baptize babies? So we've got another connection now to Roman Catholicism. And, and it says, we're always buried in the north or sunless side of the courtyard. And we're going to see about this. The seat of the junior member of the craft is allotted to the north. For symbolically, it represents the condition of the spiritually unenlightened man. The novice in whom the spiritual light latent within him has not yet risen. So again, we're talking about in all men, God is there. So we just got to bring him out. We got to let him be manifested. The initiate placed in the northeast corner is intended to see then that on the one side of him is the path that leads to the perpetual light of the east. Now we got another clue. Again, we talked about its sun worship, its Baal worship, into which he is encouraged to proceed. And that on the other is the spiritual obscurity and ignorance. What do we find out in the Bible? Heaven is in the sides of the north from where the true light comes. That's you know, something. Isn't it fascinating that, that before modern times and, and technology and, and satellites, that m men that plowed the seas or traveled on land, they kept their bearings from the north star. That's right. And Jesus, Jesus will keep, you can keep your bearing if you follow him. You won't walk in darkness. Uh, Psalms 48, 2 says this in Isaiah 14, and we're dealing with 14, 13 is where that, that uh, Lucifer says, I will ascend above the clouds and I will make my seat in the sides of the north. He wanted to set where God was setting. That's what mm -hmm. his desire was. So again, to them, it's, it's, it's just a place of darkness, and we'll see a picture of it in a few minutes. During the third degree ritual, you're killed, buried, and raised from the dead. This, by the way, is a satanic ritual. And when I, you know, you learn things and you wonder why God will, will guide you toward things. But I was reading a book.
from a former Satanist that told me that this is, they do the same thing in Satanism uh, in your initiation. The only difference is, is they literally, and they do this in some lodges, they will put you in a coffin. The Skull and Bones, which one of our former pre or two of our former presidents were members of the Skull and Bones, they do the same thing. They put you in a casket. Uh, the G, again, let's, let's look at this. One of the meanings of this symbol is God. It hangs over the worship of Master in the East, and He is the God of the Lodge. And we're going to see a picture of that in a few minutes. Let's just move on. The worshipful master stands at the foot of the grave of Hiram Abiff, which that's a, that's a myth. The candidate is, and he, he raises him. He kills, they kill him. They hit him in the head with a, with a setting mallet. And they don't really hit him. They protect him. But they knock him over, catch him with a blanket, lower him down. And then the worship of master stands at the foot of the grave and they go through a ceremony where they try to raise you with the grip of the inner prince and they try to raise you with the grip of the fellow craft and it, it, you know, and it, it don't work and it gets really gruesome. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about that because it's, but anyway, but when he reaches and gets him with the grip of the lion's paw of the tribe of Judah, he is able to raise him from the dead and bring him back to life again. And then again, what we talked about, whispering in the ear, when he raises you from the dead, he, put, he pulls you up to him, puts you on the five points of fellowship where you're standing uh, foot to foot, knee to knee, breast to breast, and uh, your, your hand to back, low breath, put your mouth to, he puts his mouth to your ear and whispers the secret word that we mentioned earlier, maha bone. And it's not supposed to be spoken out loud. It's supposed to be at low breath. So again, this is the spiritual birth of masonry. This is what, this is what they're, uh, again, being born again. And they give you the indication that you are born again and that you have some light that the outside world does not have. Can I, can I just add sure, something yes. to this? We've got to understand that with, with Freemasonry, it's not the resurrection of Jesus Christ that it's emphasized. It's the resurrection of Hiram Abiff. Going back to the ancient story where Hiram Abiff was actually killed by three ruffian, ruffians and then raised race back to life by the, the grip of a, a master mason. That's where the emphasis is. With a Christian, how can you say that another person has the power to bring resurrection? Resurrection always has to be tied to Christ. As a matter of fact, I'll even go further. Resurrection is tied to Calvary. Because the, the, the death of Jesus Christ brings forth mm -hmm. that resurrection, which is God's seal of approval on what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. So for someone to go through the initiation and to reenact, oh, we're just reenacting. Yes, but just, let me put it this way, in Freemasonry, the symbols and everything they do has a purpose behind it. So you can't say that, it's, that, it, that it means nothing. As a Christian, you shouldn't be reenacting a resurrection that is apart or separated from Christ. Absolutely. Interesting. Yes, mm -hmm. and it, there's a lot of things, and we just limited on time, but you're, you're exactly right. But let me, let me just read this verse of Scripture. This has been coming to my mind now for a couple of years as I go through this and look at it. Revelations 13, 3, And I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Ask a question. Is this what they are really acting out and have been doing for centuries? Do they know something? And I know that the normal lodge person don't know this, but the people in the hierarchy of, of, the, of Freemasonry, they know, they know what they're doing. They're not just doing this just to be doing something. They're doing <coughs> it for a reason. I can't prove that. It's just a question. Um, all right, we're going to look at this, the star at the center of the lodge floor. Uh, it is a symbol of the eastern star, and again, this book, Masonry Beyond the Light, has a whole chapter dealing with the eastern star. This is for the ladies, the, the, usually the, the mothers and daughters of Freemasons are the, really the only ones that's, that's qualified. Uh, it is one of the most powerful symbols in witchcraft and Satanism. It is called the Cirrus or the Dog Star, uh, and it's interesting again that the dog star rises in the south southern horizon. You, I remember the old folks would talk about dog days in the summer. We're in the dog days of the summer right now. It's so hot. Um, so again, we're looking at the south and not looking <coughs> at the north because we have a satanic symbol, a dog star. The inverted pentagram is the official symbol of the Church of Satan and the Temple of Set. 
and you can also find it in the Mormon temple in Utah that we Mike covered that when he did the thing on 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 Mormonism and we're going to deal with some more of that uh, make some more connections as we go on again here's the floor the, a layout of the floor of a blue lodge Masonic lodge again you look at the top you see the letter G is, is set in a sunburst we have the worshipful master sets there um, we have the south is the, is the uh, junior warden uh, the, as the sun rises in the east to rule over the day, then at high meridian at lunchtime, it's sort of in the south as it goes around, makes its journey, and then it goes and sets in the west, which is the senior warden. But look at the one on the, on the right-hand side and the north side. The north side is always the place of darkness in the lodge. Very interesting. Where God sits in the Masonic Lodge is, is the place of darkness. Here's a picture of a Masonic Lodge. Again, look at it very carefully. As we see this, we're seeing the, the Worshipful Master's Chair. We've got, again, the black and white tiles on the floor. But look look above, just above the chair where the Worshipful Master sits, and you've got the inverted bap uh goat of Mendez, inverted star behind him, and I'm persuaded that that's who's behind him. And above his head is the letter G, Again, it makes him God of the Lodge. So he's to be obeyed without question. Uh, I could tell a story about that too after I was raised and I was tried to see if I would obey without question. It didn't work. Um, but anyway, the human organism, again, this is going on with the, the book from uh, Wilmshurst, page 81, and we're going to get into the fertility cups and we're going to get into the two columns. You remember we talked and pointed out the man walks through the door, the columns, uh, he walks between the columns. The human organism is the true lodge and must be opened and wherein the great mysteries are to be found. And our lodge rooms are so built and furnished as to typify the human organism. The two pillows may be seen exemplified in the human body. They are the two legs upon which we must stand firm. And having seen the true path of initiation which is one of spiritual rebirth. Now, we're talking about, some says it's not a religion. Well, we've got a spiritual rebirth. Uh, Mr. Wilmshurst says, I refer to the great mystery, again, there's the word mystery that's connected to the 17th chapter of Revelation, of childbirth. Again, we're dealing with the fertility cults. Every child that is born into the world coming into this life as into a great house of initiation. Again, we know that that not, has nothing to do with Christianity whatsoever. Through a straight and narrow way and between two pillows. We saw that. You remember earlier the candidate comes from between the two pillows, Jackin and Boaz. The two pillows represents the legs of a female, of a woman. The two pillows that support the temple of the mother's body. The act of the physical birth is an image and a foreshadowing of the mystical rebirth and the passing through a straight gate. You remember Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And they're trying to tie this ritual of Freemasonry into that experience. Isn't that strange that they would do that? And I'm not surprised. But in a narrow way, in a deeper sense without which a man will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now they're saying this ritual is going to enter you into the kingdom of heaven. The world at large is but one great lodge and a place of initiation of which our Masonic lodges are the little mirrors, period. Then Mother Earth is also the mother lodge of us all. Again, Mother Earth connects to witchcraft. So we see the connection again here. The door you walk through and the pillars you walk between to enter into the lodge represents the legs of a woman. And I asked the question, what are you walking into, for heaven's sakes? And I did. So I, you know, but I'm, I'm trying to get you to understand what, I, what God has shown me and what I've learned. You never learn it on the inside. Hear me. You never learn the truth on the inside. And unless God can get your attention and get you to break that death oath and look on the outside, you will never know the truth. It doesn't matter whether it's 
Freemasonry, Mormonism, Catholicism, or any other cult uh, that, that's been invented and brought up, it's the same. You will never find the truth on the inside. If you do, that means you sold your soul to Satan. Jim, I gotta, I gotta ask this question. Like in, in most cults, you're not allowed to read books that are written from those on the outside. Right. Most cults will say that it's you are not to read any books that would reveal anything or say anything against what we teach, uh, because you're in danger of losing your soul. And a lot of them will even have punishments for it. They'll even say the extent, well, look, they're going to lie to try to get you out of here. What is the feeling of Freemasonry toward reading books that expose Freemasonry? They will tell you, as they told me, and, and you know, the interesting thing is uh, I confronted a, a Roman Catholic priest, uh, actually, just right after I came here and gave my testimony. And he had made some statements behind the pulpit because he was in the church that I was at that time was a part of, and it upset me very deeply. But I confronted him with some questions about, and he said to me the same thing they said in the lodge because I asked him, I said, what do you think about Alberto Rivera who come out of, of, the, of Catholicism and begin to expose it. And he said, oh, if he come out of it, then he's got something against it. So you can't depend on what he says. They said, I said, they said the same thing to me in the lodge. If they come out of the lodge, then that means they've got something against the lodge. So you cannot, you cannot take what they say. You pay can't, any can't pay any attention to it. So, okay, we walked into the lodge, which represents a woman, and it, it's a fertility cult, and, what, and, and it gets sick. If you just want to, and, and we're going to move on, at least we do, because I'm telling you. Um, then we're going to go to Ezekiel, the 8th chapter and the 14th verse, and we're going to show you that Israel was in the same place. Uh, and, and, and in this, let me just read the verse of Scripture. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the house of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Now, we know that Tammuz, and you probably know more about this than I do, Tammuz was the child of, of Nimrod and Astarte. They read that in the, in the this morning. Uh, Astaroth, or, 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 um, but this child, and again, the mother-child worship began at the Tower of Babel. They just took Mary's name and put it on, but they were weeping. Now, this Tammuz was, in modern terminology, is re referred to as the god Bacchus, which is the god of wine and reveling. So here we've got Israel is doing this. Behold, there set women weeping for Tammuz. Then said he to me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and I will show you greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. That's amazing. <laughs> Ezekiel 8:17 continued he said then he said unto me hast thou seen this o son of man is it a light thing to the house of judah that they have committed the abominations which they commit here it's an abomination to worship the sun it's an abomination to worship tammuz it's a t an abomination to wor worship the mother and child god is very clear i will not share my glory with another right. or give my praise to idols that's, God said that in Isaiah. So again, we're dealing with paganism, and this is what Freemasonry is. Their backs were turned to the temple, and they were facing the east, and they were worshiping the sun in the east. Ezekiel 18, 17 continued, For they have filled the land with violence, and have returned to provoke me to anger, and lo, they put the branch to their nose. And Jesus is the branch. Again, in this book, there's a whole chapter dealing with this about uh, Freemasonry, the Eastern Star, and all the connections. It's an excellent book. Um, let's move on because it seems like the time flies, this flies so fast. All right. We're dealing now with morals and dogmas, and I didn't bring my morals and dogmas with, with me, but it's 900 and something pages. It was written by Albert Pike, who was a Satanist, and we're going to have a picture of him in a minute. Um, so let's see what he says. And I asked the question, is this why Albert Pike praises Lucifer? 
Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to be given to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, it is he who bears the light and with its splendorous, intolerable, blinds, feeble, and sensual or selfish souls. And, and I didn't add to the fact that he said, doubt it not, because that's who he believed. He was a Satanist. He was a powerful Satanist. Page, morals and dogmas, I say immorals and dogmas, page 104. A uh, part of the oath of a master mason, listen to this, furthermore, I do promise and swear that I will not violate the chastity of a mason's wife, mother, sister, or daughter. I knowing them to be such, nor suffer it to be done by others, if in my power to prevent it. But in this book, this man says, everybody else is fair game. I'm telling you, everybody else is fair game. Most, let me not, 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 not say most, a large percentage of the Masons that I knew were womanizers. Can, can I go back for a second? Jim just talked about the fact of Lucifer and, <clears throat> and uh, the aspect of the Luciferic. Uh, uh, this, is a, this is a quote by 33rd degree Mason Manley P. Hall, right. Lost Keys of Freemasonry, page 48. It says, when the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is a proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. Notice the word craft used. Mm -hmm. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. Absolutely. And this is a 33rd degree Freemason called Manley P. Hall, which I'm not mistaken started. Did he not? Uh, no, I'm, I'm thinking of something else. But he is one of the, 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 the books that they would use in understanding the symbolism. Yes. And, and Albert Pike said that the god of Freemasonry is Luciferic in nature. Yes, he did. And remember, Lucifer is considered the god of light. Yes, they get it totally, totally turned around. Mm -hmm. it's, okay, Jim, let me ask you this. Speaking of light, because you mentioned light a number of times, uh, this email is asking uh, to you to tell the people what the three lights of Masonry are. Uh, it's the sun, the moon, and uh, I don't have it in front of me, but it's uh, they, they actually have the, the, the lights sitting there, and you saw it in the picture when the man was kneeling at the, the uh -huh. altar. They had the three lights there, the sun, the moon, and the master of the law. I believe the worshipful master. I believe the sun, moon, and worshipful master, I believe. Uh, that just happened to slip my mind, but uh, okay. it's been a long okay. time. But I believe that's the three lights of masonry. If I'm wrong, somebody correct me. Again, I've, I've wrestled with this, and you and you look at it, and you say, "Well, I could have put this in," and I, could, you know. So you just we just tried to do it uh, as best we could. Furthermore, do I promise and swear that a master mason's secret given me, and charge as such, and I knowing them to be such, shall remain as secure and inviolable in my breast as it is in his own. When communicated to me, murder and treason accepted and that left to my own election. This is a part of the Master Mason's degree. And they will, then the worshipful master will, will, before, when you're getting ready to take that oath, he will get you to say, I've done this on my own free will and accord. In other words, you're doing this on your own free will and accord and you're saying this. And this happens, I saw it work in the courtrooms, I could tell stories that, that I won't do, but but uh, dealing with this, uh, and, and, and we go in, and Mike, you may know which degree it is, but in the higher degrees of Freemasonry, murder and treason is not left to your own discretion. You're to lie on the witness stand. When it tells you, whenever they tell you that nothing that you do in this lodge will conflict with your family, with your church, or with your government, they have told a lie. If I get on a witness stand and lie to protect my brother on the witness stand for anything, it's a sin and it's an abomination. But if it's murder or treason, it is absolutely horrible. So they have lied from the very beginning, and you need to realize that. Uh, well, let's go back to the, the the three the great light the great light sorry the great lights of Freemasonry and the three lesser lights. Uh, the three great lights of Masonry are the Bible or oral law contained in it is the symbolism of the knowledge gained by investigating nature's laws in the remote in the remote past. The compass and square or written law representing the actual forces of nature, and the square relating to the physical world <coughs> to the realm of effects, and the compass relating to the inner planes the realms of causes. Together they embrace the all-natural law 
and exemplify the hermetic <coughs> axiom, as it is above, so it is below. And we've heard that phrase before, right. haven't we? Yes, we have. That's right. used in the Message, Message Bible. Now, what did he say? The three lights were the Bible, the... The Bible, the compass, and the square. The mm -hmm. Bible, the compass, and the square. According to this. And this is from C.C. <coughs> Zane. It's a quote that we have there. Because I've had this same guy email me twice about, why don't you tell the people what the three... Sure. But, but, how, but can, uh, how can you say the Bible is the light... When if what, you don't live it. When, yeah, when you're, what you're showing. Just, just because it's in the building doesn't mean anything. Uh, you know, for example, we see that the King James Bible is used by, by those that are, cons that are uh, Mormons. But if they're not living according to the teaching of the book, it means nothing to them. And the teaching very clearly says that there is not planets with gods on it. That, that uh, you get into heaven by Jesus Christ alone and not by a certificate given by Joseph Smith. So just because they have a Bible, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, organizations that have a Bible there, but doesn't make it Christian. Does not make it Christian. No. Right. I mean, they have to come down to the altar. And that altar, if, if the initiate is, is a, is a uh, Mormon, then it's going to be the, the, the books of Mormonism. If the initiate is a Satanist, it'll be a book of Satanists on that same altar. If the initiate is a Jew, it would be the Tanakh. So whatever is considered the holy book or the sacred book to that initiate is what's placed in that altar. And all of the other Freemasonries are there. Right. Now a Christian would never agree to that. Okay, let me ask this question. Uh, Quickly before we move on, uh, would uh, are there any connections between the Freemasons and the Knights of Columbus? The Knights of Columbus, and that's interesting, and and because that's a it's another Catholic subject. organization, right. right? But but John Paul II referred to the Knights of Columbus as the right arm of the Vatican when he was alive. Mm -hmm. uh, the oath of a fourth degree Knights of Columbus is really really scary. Uh, but yes, there the, there have been said to be uh, the Freemasonry of the of the Catholic Church. But we know that that at one time uh, a, a Roman Catholic was not supposed to be a Freemason. But we know that all that's over with. I've got a, I've got seven pages of printouts of of powerful Roman Catholics that are Freemasons, and so that's that's basically become. But the but the Knights of Columbus is is. Um, Roman Catholic order, and it, by the way, is a military order, and it's very powerful. Right. Now, we also have, I've had several emails asking me about different ministers of the gospel. Uh, are they Masons? Um, and then this particular email said that uh, they've read that in order for you to be president of the United States, that you have to be a 33-degree Mason. Well, I do know that Ronald Reagan was not a 33-degree Mason. Now, Jim said that Later on, he did accept an honorary degree, but he was not initiated into Freemasons like what you've been witnessing right. today that you have to do. As far as the other ministers, um, there's a list that lists all the Freemasons in the United States of America. There are a number of the preachers that are listed on there uh, that you, you would know quite well. Now, they ha all have denied that they are Freemasons, or else possibly they have renounced it as Jim did and moved away from it. But there's really, you know, for us to prove that, you can go look at on, on the Internet and you can see who's listed there. Um, and I think in Billy Graham's case that he rec his office says he recanted that and moved out of it. And he's no longer a free, Freemason. You know, those are things I don't know. Well, at one time they said he never was, and yet I've got a picture of him doing a Freemason handshake. Yes. Uh, and then later on it was that he, he had renounced it. Now, there's a man named Decker. His last name's Decker. Ed Decker. Ed yeah. Decker. He's a former one. That was written a book, and he said that when he went through his 30... Three degree riots that Billy Graham no, that was, was present. That was, Absolutely. That was Jim Shaw. Jim Shaw. Jim Shaw. You're right. Jim you're, Shaw. That's right. Right here. Uh, deadly deception. So you know Jim that's Shaw. not that's not something that the book is the deadly deception. There's not that's not something that I can answer. Uh, 15. I've got I've got a picture. And that, it's that's quite later possible. On. 
I've got some pictures. I've got a picture of Billy Graham, and I've got a picture of another. We're, just, we're not saying they are. We're just saying the same thing you said right. on the PowerPoint. That's correct. Right. And that's not what the purpose of this is all about. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. All right. It says, what the chiefs of the order really believe, and this is Albert Pike again, page 818, Morals and Dogmas, uh, are, believe is indicated to the adept. In other words, the adept is the one that really gets into it, and they sell their soul, or, or they get heavy, and they believe it by the hint contained in the higher degrees. In other words, they're, they're convinced, and we're de we'll deal with the Blue Lodge in a minute, uh, contained in the higher degrees of Freemasonry and by the symbols which only the adepts understand. In other words, my dad was per persuaded that the Blue Lodge was all the Masons that there was, and it, and it tells that. The Blue Lodge, again, page continued on from page 18, eight, 18 Morals and dogmas, the blue degrees are but the outer court or portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there. Now, you Blue Lodge Masons, listen to this. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine that he understands them. And as you know, as you go on into the higher degrees, Albert Pike says to the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degree, you tell them that Lucifer is God. Okay, before you move on quickly, um, Mike, I want to ask this question. In, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, right. does that represent King Solomon repenting and getting right with the Lord? Well, we hope so. We pray it. Then. Let me put it this way. I think just because there are statements that would appear as if he has remorse over previous actions does not necessarily say. And I don't know, I, I hope he did repent. Uh, Brother Swaggart says, Solomon as the preacher, although in the latter years losing his way with God, nevertheless preached the most powerful evangelistic message ever preached as recorded in the book of Ecclesiastes. I don't know. I, I remember once uh, I, was doing, I was doing inner city bus ministry here. Sister Stragon, we, we would bring in 1,400 kids on a Saturday. And I remember going to this house, and this man was a drug dealer. This, this man, I mean, he was dealing with some heavy stuff. But every Saturday, he made sure that his child went to hear about Jesus. In other words, you would think that, well, that's a sign of repentance. He realizes the need for Jesus. Yeah. No, he realized he thought with him, there's no hope. But the next generation, there would be hope. So I don't know. And it's one of those questions, uh, I think Brother Swagger said it this way. When we get to heaven, we'd be surprised on who's up yeah. there, and we'll be surprised on who's There's not up there. There's nothing in, we don't in know. the Bible that clearly that we could go back and look at any verse of Scripture that would state that, that Solomon repented. And it's the, uh, <clears throat> most of the scholars believe that he never repented when you read behind them. Okay, Jim, we quickly, we, we're running out of time, oh, yes. so let's finish this. Again, thing. dealing with this same thing in the Blue Lodge, uh, their true explanation is reserved for the adepts, again, the Prince of Masons. It is well enough for the masses of those who call Masons to imagine that all is contained in the Blue Degrees, and whoso uh, attempts to undeceive them will labor in vain and will, without any true reward, uh, violate his as an adept. In other words, you can't change them. Uh, let me move on very quickly. Morals and dogmas, let's get into this. Page 11, morals and dogmas again. You Blue Lodge Masons and all of you really. The, the Holy Bible, square and compass, are the only styles of great light in the Masons. And that's, I guess that's where I got some of what I said about the, the, the Bible and you and that. But they, but they are also technically called the furniture of the Lodge. Now let me say this. The Bible is not a piece of furniture. It's the, it's the Word of God. It is inspired. That's right. Okay, Jim, we're going to have to cut it off right. there. We're out of time. Okay, I, we'll, we'll, I'm going to back up, and I'll start back tomorrow. If, you, if, if we do it okay. tomorrow, I'll start back with this one about the, the Bible and the square and compass and uh, morals and dogmas and show you what is really said about the Lodge and the holy books that they call holy books. We've got several slides dealing with that and coming right down to modern time. If you say morals and dogmas, I don't know Albert Pike, don't know anything about him. There was a Bible on my, on my uh, uh, altar in my lodge, and I'm going to show you a film, I mean a, a slide that happened in on Good Morning America. Okay. 
Yeah. All right. And, uh, and with that, we've got to close. We'll be back with you tomorrow. And thank you, Jim, mm-hmm. uh, for presenting this to us. Uh, we love you. God bless you. And we'll be back tomorrow. And let Jim finish this. Good morning, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here and, and deal with this. Uh, and we've, we've established that the fact that Freemasonry is a religion, although some says that it's not. We have a temple. We have a room with an altar. We have a holy book with some most time, most of the places in, in America is a, a holy Bible. But it can be a Quran or, a, or any other book that the, the candidate holds. And we, we're going to be going into that just in a few minutes. But just giving you a little review, we started out sort of with a, the, the lambskin apron. This is what they tell you whenever they present this apron to you. And I didn't have it yesterday, but I've got it today. They present it to you, and, and I'm just going to say that it's supposed to be representative of your life, keeping it pure. But this is what it says in this presentation. It says that they may, may the records of your life and actions be as pure and spotless as this fair emblem, which is I place within your hands tonight. And when your trembling souls shall stand naked before the great white throne, there to receive judgment for the deeds done while in this body. Uh, and, and we'll just stop there because let me tell you this. If you're standing before the great white throne <laughs> judgment, right. you have missed the rapture right, and you're right. headed for the lake of fire. So that's if right. you're depending on a white lambskin apron to get you through the great white throne judgment, you're very foolish. It's not going to happen. The Bible is very clear. We've established the fact and, and Mike touched on it yeah, let me ask a question, Jim. <coughs> this apron, when is it presented to the candidates? In the independence degree, in the first degree. It's presented first to degree. You. Yes, the first the degree. The reason I'm asking, I've heard people make mention of it. Is it used then after that? The, no, it's basically your personal. You will take that home with you, but any time you enter the lodge, you will put on a, an apron that they will give you in the lodge, and it's uh, it's got a meaning, and we may get a chance to deal with okay. that a little bit too. But, but again, Mike touched on this, and I'm going to read you what it says. This is from uh, Manly P. Hall, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. It says, The true Mason is not creed-bound. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that as a Mason, his religion must be universal. Guess what? Universal Church, and we know some others that's that's, uh, that's doing this. We we remember, you remember when... uh, uh, Bush was the president. He went, to, right. he went to Japan and knelt at the altar there, went in and clapped his hands. And, but it says, Christ, Buddha, or Mohammed, uh, the, the names mean little, for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in a temple, a mosque, or a cathedral, realizing w- with his truer understanding the oneness of all spiritual truth. This is Freemasonry. So again. actually, it's, it's, they believe in all gods. All gods. And the, again, you're free to worship any of them, they say. And they do that in the lodge. I mean, you, I've, got, I've got books from the, the, that Freemasonry puts out. It's, it's uh, the Scottish Rite. It used to be called the New Age, and then they changed it because of all the New Age stuff coming out. And they talk about sitting in the lodge and here beside me is a Muslim and behind me may be a Roman Catholic and, you know, on and on and on. And, and we don't, we, we, and that, there's something about that, though, that's alluring. Oh, we can get along. We can settle. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read something a little later as we get into this. But anyway, this is, again, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry by Manly P. Hall. Can I, can I just add sure. something that goes along with this concept that, that they, they, they take away the deity of Christ, and I'm sure Christian Masons right now are upset about it, but you put them on the same level as these sure. others. And let me read this. Uh, this. This is from a, a website called Ex-Masons for Jesus, mm-hmm. and this is, this is a quote from a Freemason book. All believe in a future life to be attained by purification and trials in a state of successive states of reward and punishment and in a mediator or redeemer by whom the evil principle <coughs> was to overcome and the supreme deity rec- reconciled to his crea- creatures. The belief was generally that he was to be born of a virgin and suffer a painful death. The Hindus call him Krishna, the Chinese Kionse, the Persians Shoshash, the Chaldeans Duvenet, the Egyptians Horus, Plato Love, the Scandinavians Balder, the Christians Jesus, Masons Hiram. Thank and that is very troubling. 
Yes, it that is. That a Christian, especially, <laughs> and there are a lot of Christian pastors yes. that are Freemasons. How do you get around statements like this? How do you get around what he just Good read by, by, by Hall where it said that you look at the light, you don't look at the light bearer, you just look at the light. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Truth is what God says. And that's my source of truth. Yes. That's not, right. not, you know, not but Adolf Hitler or anybody else or <coughs> philosophy. And so I, these are troubling things. Yes, it is. And, and you know, we read, we quoted many scriptures yesterday, read them, put them on the screen uh, of what Jesus said, I am the light. And if you walk in me, you'll never, if you follow me, you'll never walk in darkness. Now we're going to go to the, where we left off yesterday. Uh, and, and, we, and I'm going to read something as, as we deal with this. Again, it's Freemasonry Christian, and we're going to go to the book called Morals and Dogmas. I refer to it as Immorals and Dogmas. It's by Albert Pike, who was the sovereign pontiff, by the way, of worldwide masonry from 1850-something uh, until the 60s, I believe. Uh, but this is what you say before you take this oath, and, and I can remember it vaguely, but I found it and I know that it, that it happened. The worshipful master, three raps addressing the candidate, and, he, and in this it, it shows the figure of what he's doing, and he's actually addressing the one that we talked about, about the Reverend Hunt, uh, that was a reverend that had come to the doors, and he'd been walking in darkness, and he was seeking light, the light of Freemasonry, that the veil would be, you know, and we dealt, dealt with that yesterday. He says, Brother Hunt, you are now at the altar of masonry for the third time. This is the third degree. This is the oath we're going to be dealing with or have already dealt with. But before proceeding further, it, is, it becomes my duty as worshipful master of this lodge to inform you that it will be necessary that you take upon yourself a solemn oath or obligation pertaining to this degree. As I can assure you, listen to this now, listen to this. As I can assure you, upon the honor of a man and a mason that in this obligation there is nothing that will conflict with any duty you owe to God, your country, your family, your neighbor, or yourself. And in your advancement thus far you have repeatedly assured us it was of your own free will and accord and if you are still of that mind you will advance to the altar. And we're going to, you know, and we, 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 we went over the, the oath yesterday where you, you uh, take an oath not to uh, have a sexual relationship with another Mason's wife, mother, sister, or daughter, but everybody else is open season. Uh, and it's very clear. And look, I've, I've heard enough testimonies to know that that's true. But, but again, let's, let's look in, again, looking at, at, the, at the altar in a Masonic lodge, we're going to go to this. This is number 73 where we left off yesterday. Is Freemasonry Christian, Morals and Dogmas, page 11. Uh, the Holy Bible, square and compass, are not only styled the great lights in masonry, but they are also technically called the furniture of the lodge. And as we said yesterday, the Holy Bible is more than a piece of furniture. It is God's Word. The Bible says it is quick and powerful. It's sharper than any two. In other words, it's alive. So we don't compare it to... And I got a, a, an email from someone yesterday talking about we, we discussed the, the great lights of masonry and he was concerned because I didn't say anything. And, and it's the Holy Bible square and compass. Well, again, you're comparing the Bible, God's Holy Word, to a square or a compass and putting them equal as far as they're concerned. So all of this is not Christian. None of this is Christian. Uh, and as we move on, let's see what the rest of this says again going on. And it is held that there is no lodge without them. This has sometimes been a pretext to exclude Jews from lodges because they cannot regard the New Testament as a holy book. The Bible is an indispensable part of the furniture of a Christian lodge only because it is the sacred book of the Christian religion. The Hebrew Pentateuch in the Hebrew Lodge and the Quran in a Mohammedan one belong on the altar and one of these and the square and compass properly understood are the great lights by which a mason must walk and work. So again, it can be, a Bible can be equal to their their instruments there, the square and compass, or a Quran can be equal, or whatever other holy book. And whenever you get to some of the other lodges, and I have the, the, the books where men have come out and where they, they will put any book that's held holy by Buddhist, whatever. Uh, so we understand now that if you believe 
that it's Christian. If you believe Freemasonry is Christian, then you ought to listen to what this says because it can be any book. And we're going to, and you, and I know what people will say a lot of them because I've heard them say, well, I don't know who Albert Pike is. We don't believe him. We got a, we got a King James Version Bible on our altar. And that's what all lodges have. Well, let me show you something. Uh, let me say, let me finish this though. The obligation of the candidate is always to be taken on the sacred book or books of his religion that he may deem it more solemn and binding. And therefore, it was that you were asked of what religion you were. We have no other concern with your religious creed. They just want to know what will, what will bind you to them and they can control you with, and they will use whatever is necessary to do that. So an atheist could not be a Freemason, but a, but a, a witch could. A Satanist can. A William, Satanist William could. William Shenevlin was a Satanist, but he believed in God. He believed Satan was God. And he and the first question on a petition is, do you believe in God? Well, sure, but William Shenevlin believed, believed in God. And so he said yes. And so, you know, but that's this is what we're talking about. And again, this is, this is the, the deception that people need to learn about that profess to be Christian. Some of them ministers. And I'm talking about not, you know, we know that the, that the Baptist denomination is full of Freemasons, ministers as well as deacons. They love to get control of the pastor, uh, and some of them are just good old boys. They just, they just, you know. But if they, if it comes down to a decision, they're going to do what their oath tells them to do. So let's move now down to modern times. If you believe that Albert Pike was out to lunch and he didn't know what he was talking about, we're going to come right down and listen. If you want to go to Good Morning America on uh, April the 19th in 2006, you can go there and get just exactly what I've got. Plus, you can get a film clip of what this man is saying. S. Brent Morris, who is a 33rd degree Mason, master of the royal secret. You remember, Shenevlin was talking about how they had made him the, the master of the royal secret, and they like all these fancy names and titles, and, and again, it's to get control of you. But he is, uh, this, he's a 33rd degree Mason, master of the royal secret, and managing editor of the Scottish Rite Journal, had this to say. And again, go there and get it. It's still there on Good Morning America, unless they see this and jerk it off. But anyway, that's happened too. Freemasonry was not a religion. It had overarching religious principles that were part of Mason's rich tradition. The Freemasons did something very radical 300 years ago. Now again, we're talking about modern. We're talking about 2006. Uh, we said that men can agree that God exists and that he compels them to do good in their life and we can stop all religious discussions at that point and go out and do good to help mankind. What is the seeker sensitive church doing today? They're, do, they're doing thing. good yeah. things that makes them feel good, and it drains a lot of attention, just like the Pharisees would, would gather a crowd together and say their loud, long, beautiful prayers, and Jesus said, that's all the reward they're going to get. That's all they're going to get. Um, so it says, again, going on with this, so Freemasons invite any believer in God, and I put a God, which is true, to join them, said Morris. Morris also said Freemasons display a Bible, a Quran, and a Torah on their altars. So if you don't believe me, go to Good Morning America, pull this article up, and it's written there. And, and I just pulled excerpts out of it, but I did not do any damage to it because this is what he said. Because we just don't have time to, to, to print or show everything that he said. Okay, we mentioned this a little bit yesterday. This picture of Billy Graham receiving the yoke of Rome from a Jesuit Belmont Abbey co College as a young man. And this, we're not saying he is. We're saying what Jim Shaw said. We already said it yesterday. Jim Shaw said Billy Graham was at his 33rd degree uh, ritual when he was went into the 33rd degree temple. Again, I know that people are going to get upset. And he, if he's renounced it, then I would love to have a copy of that. Other than that, we're just going to move on. Then we go, uh, this is something else that you can actually go to Larry King Live to his website, uh, and you can pull this up and read it for yourself. When John Paul uh, II passed away, uh, he was invited on to Larry King Live to do a, a program to pay tribute to John Paul II. 
And uh, this is what it says. Again, April the 2nd, 2005, interview with Larry King. Uh, King, he, John Paul, called you brother. Billy Graham, when he, John Paul, was elevated to the papacy, I was preaching in Krakow, Poland, John Paul's cathedral. Billy Graham, he, John Paul, to called me brother, and I loved him and called his message Christian. It's on the website. You can go get it. Uh, so we're just saying he, he's connected, and we've been making these connections. Freemasonry is connected to the Roman Catholic Church, and it's also connected to Islam. We're going to move on. We've got one more dealing with this, and again, this is what a, this is. This happened in 1986, Time Magazine. Pat Robinson displaying to the world the lion's paw, the grip of a Freemason. Now, is he a Freemason? I don't know. That's the reason why I put it the way I did. He's displaying this to the world, the grip of a Master Mason, what you're raised from the dead with. Again, 1986, Time Magazine. All right, let's make some more connections. Here we have a picture of Jacqueline de Molay, who was supposedly the last Grand Master of the Knights Templar, which was totally a Roman Catholic order. And you know, if you know the story of them, they was in Jerusalem. They protected the pilgrims going on the, uh, their trips to, to Jerusalem. And so we have him now, a totally a Roman Catholic. Then the de Molay, which is the the younger men, before they're old enough to join the Masonic Lodge, they got an order called the Demole. And you see, again, you see the swords with the Knight Templar swords. That's the way they designed them. The Knights Templars designed them. Why would a Protestant organization, secret society, take a Roman Catholic and make him the name of their Demole? Again, we got a connection there. Uh, we got the symbol of the Shriners is totally Islam. Every symbol that they got. So we're showing you how that, that all of this has infiltrated. You know, again, we read that verse of Scripture where it says, Matthew 13, 33 said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a woman that took leaven and hid it in three measures of meal until the whole was leavened. So we look at this, and there's lists, and there's hundreds and probably thousands of other connections. But this one, again, on the left is Kappa Sigma. Again, we have the crescent moon. We have the inverted pentagram, a star, the star of Satan, or the church of Set. Uh, on the, on the uh, crescent moon, we have the skull and bones, which is a part of Master Masons or Masons. Uh, again, on the left-hand side of the crescent moon, we have the keys that we talked about, where the Pope has the keys that, you know, the, his coat of arms always has the keys that supposedly Jesus gave to Peter. Uh, and we know that they wasn't literal physical keys. But anyway, then on the left-hand side, again, of this crescent moon, we have the Knights Templar swords. The person who is going to be wearing these symbols, they had to make an oath in that degree, because in every degree you make another sure. oath. Who do they make this oath to? I don't know. I don't know who. I, I really don't know. Isn't this oath done to Allah? You're oh, you're talking about the, the crescent moon, the Shriners? Absolutely. And and, and to be a Shriner, isn't your shriner, oath made yeah. to Allah? Yeah, it's made to Allah, and it's made on the Quran. Absolutely, because I've got I've got the information. I just didn't put it on. I just didn't want to. You see how troubling that is. That's significant. It really is. Yes, but it is. I mean, <laughs> let's move on. Again, we see this as young as the Cub Scouts. We see the grip of a Cub Scout and then right below it the grip of a Freemason and you see the, the same quality characteristics. We look at the Boy Scouts which is the next level up from Cub Scouts. We see another connection to the Roman Catholic Church. The symbol of a Boy Scout is the Flor de Lee or Flor de Lou is pronounced and spelled different ways but that's a symbol of the Roman Catholic Church. It points, if you do some research, it points directly to the Virgin Mary. Uh, again, the, the Cub Scouts, we have the, the, the uh, wolf and uh, the symbol again the Florida de Lee at the, at the bottom of that uh, if you do some research on that wolf you would find out that it's it's not as pre pretty as it would like they would like for it to be here's another connection Albert Pike founded the Ku Klux Klan uh, we see the the hoods and uh, the pointed caps uh, we dealt with this when brother Ma uh, brother Mike was dealing with the Jehovah Witnesses the pyramid, which is another symbol of the Illuminati and Freemasonry. Then over on the left-hand side, we see an order in the Roman Catholic Church. So we see that 
that's that order with the pointed hats and the white sheets and all that has been around a lot longer than the Ku Klux Klan. So again, just making connections. Is that is that the Knights of Columbus? No, okay, no, it's no. not. This is the Ku Klux Klan. It was founded after the Civil War, uh, and so it, it's, it's a lot of information. Yeah. So there's a lot of information there that we just don't have time to deal with. Again, Joseph Smith was a high degree Freemason, founded the cult, the Mormon cult. There's some connections there too. All right, let's, we got the, uh, the third sound bite. Uh, you can play that now, please. I had been told many years earlier by this grand druid fellow down in Arkansas that if I ever got in really deep spiritual trouble, what I needed to do was join the Mormon church because the Mormon church had been started by witches for witches for the express purpose of giving, giving people a place, like, a, place, a place for people like me to hide out and appear to be nice, conservative, white bread, Republican Christians, you know, even though we secretly believed all the same things that witches believed. Now, that might surprise you, but believe it or not, there's plenty of documentary evidence. We go into some of it in our book on the back table called Mormonism's Temple of Doom. That, involved, that proves that Joseph Smith was in fact a warlock, the founder of the Mormon church, and most of the early church leaders were deeply involved in sorcery. So anyway, we got into the church, we joined it, they, they loved us, we went through the ranks, I became an elders quorum president, we went to the temple, we had been told by this druid that it would be a profoundly occult experience, and guess what, he was right. It was the high point of our occult life. We, we really thought we were on the right track here because we were part of this huge, powerful, wealthy church, and yet we were still serving Lucifer. It was like the best of both worlds. In fact, we had a meeting about two days after we were sealed with Elder Faust, who at that time was one of the 12 apostles. Uh, I think he was the low man on a totem pole. That's like the ruling hierarchy of the entire Mormon church internationally. We got in there because we knew certain signs and words and tokens. And uh, he told us, after a lengthy interview, he bore us his solemn testimony that Lucifer was in fact the god of the Mormon temple. And we're back, and again, that was to remind you, yesterday we dealt with William Schneblin, uh the book uh, Masonry Beyond Light. He's written several books. He has quite a number of DVDs. He has one entitled The Temple of Doom, which is about Mormonism. Uh, and as you, if you heard it yesterday, he was he went all the way up. He uh, he went all the way up to the 90th degree, and from the 32nd degree to the 97th degree is totally Roman Catholic. And he on his way up the ladder to become a satanic priest, he had to join the lodge, and then he had to join the Roman Catholic Church. So just to give you a little refreshment on what what we saw yesterday, again we're dealing with connections. Uh, we have here the sunburst of the Jesuits. Again, it's sun worship. This is what we've been telling you. It's Baal worship. It's sun worship. Uh, and, and it's interesting that, that the, the, the uh, flames coming out of the sunburst, uh, there's 32 of them on there. And so some have said, well, that's a connection to the 32nd degree. Don't know that. It just happens to be there. In his service uh, also stands for Ice, Horse, and Set, doesn't it, Mike? And that's mm -hmm. what, what mm -hmm. we've read about that. So again, we're dealing with paganism, and then on the, the right-hand side is the 33rd degree temple in Washington, D.C. We have the lion's head, and we have the same sunburst in this, this lodge. This is interesting. I just added this to show you. Again, uh, let's start with the, with the right-hand side. We have, uh, this is in a church in Chicago, Illinois. It's a Roman Catholic church. It's actually uh, connected, got some connections to the Greek Orthodox. Uh, but here we have, they have rebuilt the uh, Ark of the Covenant. They have Mary sitting on the mercy seat. Uh, we have a crescent moon there which connects to Islam. And uh, in her, on her breast is a huge sunburst with the, with the wafer there. And they call it a monstance. Is that how you say it, Mike? Monstrance. Monstrance. Uh, so we have Mary there, and she's, she's in the place of, of deity and... and uh, we know that they're, they're saying that she's co-redemptress. And then on the right-hand side, again, making the connection that when the priest took, takes the round wafer, which is a sun disk, and places it in this sunburst, then they worship this. They worship this sunburst and this, this wafer. And, and, in, and in this, uh, this sunburst is, again, the crescent moon at the bottom of it. So we, see, we, we have all the connections to, again, a universal religion and we're, we're, it's so interesting. This is a very interesting photograph. 
uh, when John Paul II died, um, this is this is very it's hurtful to me because we have President Bush, who at that time was the present president of the United States, his wife, his father, former president, and former president Bill Clinton, Candelisa Rice, they're on their knees <coughs> kneeling to John Paul, the dead body of John Paul II. So we see a very powerful, powerful religious system that can draw this many former presidents to the, of the United States to the funeral. There was uh, four kings, five queens, and 70 presidents present at the funeral of John Paul II. Um, all right, we've got, this is a, the altar inside of the 33rd degree temple in Washington, D.C., 33rd degree altar of Washington, D.C., Bible, Koran, and a Hindu, a holy book, which I could have put, but I couldn't pronounce it, so I just left it as a Hindu, but it very, very clearly says it's a Hindu book. We have the center of the Grand Mosque in Mecca is also, uh, also a black stone altar, and this is part of what the religion of Islam, so we got another connection there. This is very interesting. Jim Shaw, the, uh, Extinguishing the Candle. Jim Shaw was a 33rd degree Freemason. The book, The Deadly Deception. Uh, it's interesting, very easy to read, very informative. Uh, had been a Mason, had grew up as, you know, years in the masonry, and they decided to take a grassroots guy and make him a 33rd degree. This was many years ago, back in the 80s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he was taken to the to the temple in Washington D.C. And, and went through the the lodge. But God was already dealing with him. I believe he was uh, his dentist. I believe he was uh, having some work done on his teeth. And his dentist was a Christian. And his dentist began to w witness to him. But he went on and went through the ritual. And he shares this on page 107 in this book, The Deadly Deception. You know that that the Roman Catholic Church in the Mass. Uh, they believe this, uh, what is called transubstantiation, that they bring Jesus down from heaven in his glorified body. They change him over to his flesh and blood body. They kill him, eat his flesh, and drink his blood. That's the Mass. That's the Roman Catholic Mass. It's literally done thousands of times a day around the world. The, the, more, the, the Freemasons has a similar... I didn't know this until I read this book. There's, and as he deals with this... He says there, and I'm just picking up set excerpts from it, so you can go get the book, or you can actually go online and pull this up and, and read it and have it for yourself. There was a la large menorah or candlestick with seven candle holders in the center of the room, with seven candles now burning. Um, standing again, I said, and again, by the way, if you read the whole article, these men were dressed in monk robes. This is indeed a sad day, he says, for we have lost our master. We may n never see him again. He is dead. Mourn, weep, and cry, for he is gone. Then I asked the officers to extinguish the candles in the large menorah. One by one they rose and walked to the center of the room and, extin and extinguished a selected candle and left the room. Finally, with only one center candle still burning, I rose, walked sadly to the menorah. Now, God was dealing with him because God was already dealing with him, and this was the last one that he ever did. I rose and walked sadly to the menorah and extinguished the last candle, the candle representing the life of Jesus, our most wise and perfect master. We had dramatized and commemorated the snuffing out of the life of Jesus without once mentioning his name. And the scene ended with the room in deep, silent darkness. I walked out of the room, leaving only the darkness and the stillness of death. Again, Jim Shaw, uh, uh, The Deadly Deception, page 107. Once again, the single best word to describe it would be black or darkness. Again, we said yesterday, Jesus said, Beware lest that that you think is light is not really darkness. All right, we're going to see another connection in our nation's capital. The Washington National Monument is a giant male phallus. Now, we talked about that yesterday. There's two things. There's two things in, in history from the dawn of time that has been worshipped more than anything else, and that is the sun and the male phallus because they both bring life. 
So we're going to look at this and see how powerful Freemasonry is and the control that they have and have had actually from the inception of this country. I do not believe our founding fathers knew what they were doing. I, I have to believe that. I don't believe anybody that was that was obsessed or, or by Satan could write a constitution like they wrote in a Bill of Rights. But we see, again, the leaven. The woman that hid the leaven is working, and today it has, for lack of a better word, it has evolved into something that's very horrible. But the Washington National Monument is a giant male phallus, It's also known as Baal Shaft. And listen to this. On, and inscribed on the east face of the capstone is Laos Dios. Now, again, that's Latin. Why would they use Latin? I mean, we're in America. Why would they use Latin to write praise be to God? And everybody says, oh, isn't that great? Isn't that just wonderful that they would do that, you know, in our state capital? And they have that on this. this uh... But how would you feel if you was God and sticking in your face on the, on the point of a, a male phallus that, that term? I think it's disgusting. Now, that's my opinion. If you don't feel that way, then that's okay. But that's, that's what they did. This is what Freemasonry did. And again, we have a picture of, of the Washington National Monument. We have a picture of the architecture of the, of the uh, nation's capital, which again, we have a picture of the fertility cults. We have the male phallus. We have the woman's breast. We go here. Washington and Rome have the same architecture. We have, the, again, the bell shaft and in the background, uh, the Vatican is the female breast, and so we just move on. Uh, again, we have something here. We have the, this Masonic altar is on the main road from Jer Egypt to Jerusalem. We have, again, the, the two, uh, two pillars. pillars. Yeah. We have the pyramid. We have the, the Freemason Blue Lodge symbol. We have the cornerstone. Uh, and it's it's there. So and, and if you would go in, and I have pictures of Jerusalem. There's there's several of them in in Jerusalem. So we see the power of this uh, religion of Freemasonry and its connections to so many different religions. Just going to touch on this very quickly and move on. This is interesting. Let me see if I can find this. This book. Uh, this is by uh, Charles. G. Finney, who was a, a, a powerful minister back in the early 1800s, uh, and he was a lawyer. He got saved. He wrote this book exposing Freemasonry, and, and from the lawyer standpoint, he presented as a courtroom. I mean, he had depositions, and he presented, and to him, he actually, it was to me reading it, it was like he put it on trial, and he proved beyond any shadow of a doubt that Freemasonry is not Christian, and it is evil, and it's wicked. And again, this is a uh, very, very good book. Again, in 1882, a large monument to uh, Captain William Morgan was placed uh, in the Bativia City Cemetery. And I don't have a picture of it. I could have got one. Uh, he was abducted in the year of 1826 by Freemasons and murdered for revealing the secrets of their order. Uh, so they've done this in the past. And uh, but anyway, let's touch, just touch on this, and we're getting, getting toward the end very quickly. A book entitled 50 Years in the Church of Rome by a former Roman Catholic priest named Charles Chenequay. Very, It's got a lot of American history. It's very, very interesting, and if you, you, know, if you would like to, you can actually pull it up on the Internet and read it. It's, it's 600 pages or right at it. And this is what he said that his professors taught him, and we're only going to touch on this. It said, My professors of philosophy and history and theology has been unanimous in telling me that the principles and laws of the Church of Rome are absolutely antagonistic to the laws and principles which are the foundation stones of the Constitution of the United States. And we're going to go now to the last soundbite. The next thing that happened, before I could get on to the priesthood of Satanism, I had to get seven people to sell our souls to the devil. The other thing I had to do, and this might astonish some of you, is I had to become a Catholic priest. I had to go back to my original vocation. Because you cannot be a satanic priest unless, first of all, you're a Catholic priest. And if that surprises you, I just suggest that you go and you read some of the medieval literature. You'll see that that is, in fact, the case. I had discovered a bishop of the old Catholic church in the city of Milwaukee who was born in Wailing to ordain me as a priest in exchange for me making him a witch priest. It was sort of a quid pro quo thing. But anyhow, what happened was, is uh, I got consecrated a Catholic priest, and then 
Later on, I got involved with a, the, the patriarch of the Gnostic Catholic Church down in Chicago. And this is my certificate being ordained, uh, pardon me, consecrated as a bishop in the, old, in the Gnostic Catholic Church. And uh, you'll notice a couple of other things that might be important here. One is that you'll notice that this is the ancient and primitive rite of Memphis and Misrium. Now, this is in French, and I apologize for that. Uh, the certificate is in my book, uh, Lucifer Dethroned, if you want to see it and, and try and translate it. Now, the rite of Memphis and Misrium is the rite of masonry that a lot of masons aren't aware even exists. And this rite has 97 degrees. And I was raised to the 90th degree within that. If you'll notice down here, it says I was given the title of Grand Master of the Order of the Temple. That's 90th degree. And at the same time, I was made the Auxiliary Bishop of Milwaukee of the Gnostic Catholic Church. That's, again, uh, uh, William Schneblin. Uh, and you heard what he said, and it's very interesting, and it's, it shows how powerful these orders are and how much control that they have, not only in the United States, but in the world. Um, and the 28th President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, uh, stating, since I entered politics, I have ch uh, chiefly had men's views confided to me privately, some of the biggest men in the U.S. in the field of commerce and manufacturing, are afraid of somebody, are, are afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtile, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation. So we see this is a, come from him, and we know, we just, you know, we know this there because he said so, we see the, the roots of it. And we just ask the question, who is it? And we, th we know who it is, really. We just, but uh, again, let's move on. Uh, Revelation 18, and this is sort of winding it down um, to where we know the Bible says 13th, 17th, 18th uh, chapters of, of Revelation, which we know the church will be gone, God, but God's still going to be dealing with the world system. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean bird. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be my, not partakers of her sins, uh, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And again, rejoice over her, you heavens, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you of her. And let's close with that. But let me say this. Uh, there's a book entitled uh, Windswept House. It's written by a, a Jesuit priest. His name is Malachi Martin. And in that book, uh, in the very beginning of it, he, he talks about, and, and I had it here somewhere. I don't know exactly where it's at, but where in, uh, in I believe it was 1963, uh, they actually had a ritual in the Vatican and also here in the United States and they seated Lucifer on the throne there, and it's, it's a ritual. And you can read it if you'd like to. It doesn't matter, but I'm just saying this is where we're coming to. We want to warn you that we're living in the last days. We're living in the end of this age, and the devil is having a field day, and the pastors are playing games, and they're doing all their good things. It makes them feel warm and fuzzy, and the people are going to hell. We need to wake up, and we need to repent, and we need to preach the gospel and get away from all this. May the Lord bless you. Amen. We need to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was a question that was asked. It says um, that the principles of Freemasonry are taught in the Kabbalah as well. Mike, do you or Jim have any information on that? I don't know yeah. what the Kabbalah... Now, this email goes on to say that I've had many debates with the Jewish people who are part of the Kabbalah, and they reject that notion. But even Freemason scholars say that Freemasonry yeah. derives itself from the Kabbalah. Absolutely, and that, I've read that, and, but I'm not, and I have uh, some DVDs with it on, I just don't have time to read it. Uh, that stuff is, is, is depressing. I know whenever God got me out of Freemasonry, I, I spent 
four years of deep, deep research, and it would get so bad from time, I'd just have to lay it all aside and get in my prayer closet and let the Holy Spirit wash me out and get me clean, and then I would go back. But I know now that it was God having me to learn, and somebody said, well, you're supposed to be some kind of an authority. No, I never claimed to be an authority. I've just been there. I know what they believe, and I know what God taught me. I'm not an authority on Freemasonry or the Kabbalah or anything else, but I know some things that I've learned. But as I researched that time, in that time period, uh, I learned a lot about what's going on. And, and, and I come to the place that if God had not first got me in in rooted and grounded in his word that I knew who he was and if if I hadn't have, and I, I, I wonder if a lot of these preachers and a lot of these politicians didn't come to that place I would have if I hadn't have known God's word I would have come to the conclusion we cannot win it's impossible they have it sewed up but I'm telling you Jesus Christ is still going to win and that's our hope our blessed hope is he will appear and so this is where we're at in the world today that we live in, in the United States.